Well, thank you very much um, for the introductions, and thank you everyone for having us here. I have to say, as an impact investor, this is this is where I want to be. Like this is this has been a great day. I think you guys are going to have a wonderful next two days. Enjoyed a bunch of the things I've already heard today, and I'm really excited to be on stage with Russell because we actually haven't seen each other in person in over a year. So. <laughs> Um, I've known Russell for about seven years <clears throat> since I've joined the board of Vital Farms back in 2014 and I've had the honor and pleasure of sitting on the sidelines as a board member watching this management team grow the business over tenfold um, organically with no acquisitions, uh, bring the company public, uh, become a B Corp which was not necessarily the easiest decision and discussion around the board table at one point in time if you go back three to five years. And, and it's been a true pleasure and an honor to be uh, associated with the company. But this is about Russell. So if I may, I'd love to start our chat before we get into our discussions um, with just a kind of a quick summary, maybe how you got introduced um, into conscious capitalism. Because if I remember correctly, it wasn't before you uh, joined Vital of Arms in 2014. Thanks, Carl. And before I go there, I think I have to address an elephant in the room. Maybe it's my elephant, not anybody else's elephant. Um, I've been to a few of these over the years in the audience, never been on stage before. And time and time again, I would come here and I would feel so inspired by the speakers. And I would want, I would aspire to help myself and my organization get to even half of where it felt like they had gotten to in terms of being conscious leaders, leading conscious companies, and, and ultimately having the impact on the world that they wanted to have. Um, it was intimidating, frankly. And sometimes it felt like it was an impossible kind of climb to get to that level of uh, performance or even, um, even that level of um, ability to just tell, tell your story. So I'm really honored to be up here on the stage. Um, but I'm also a little intimidated by it, so I just wanted to share that. <laughs> now, Carl, you asked about my journey toward conscious capitalism, and the reality is that I went to a fancy business school in the late 90s, and I remember uh, in week one uh, having the debate around the role of the firm and the role of management. And on one side, uh, you know, were the, hey, the role of management is to maximize shareholder value, anything other than maximizing shareholder value amounts to charity, and if you're gonna give money away, you ought to give it back to the shareholders and let them decide which charities to give it to. Uh, on the other side were uh, the people who believed in a different model, believed in uh, a notion of multi-stakeholder capitalism, and believed that for your organization to uh, endure over time, to be sustainable, um, uh, over time, it's got to be sustainable for all those stakeholders. And the camps largely were the American kids versus everybody else, frankly. You can guess which one fell where. Um, and I spent, you know, the next fifth, almost 15 years firmly rooted in do what I got to do to make the number. That's what's good for everybody. And I am, a, I am to this day a fervent believer in the capitalist system. I, that hasn't changed at all. But a funny thing happened back in 2014 when I landed at Vital Farms, which is, and Vital Farms is a, an Austin-based company. We're in the food business. Um, when I got there in, in 2014, it was seven years into its journey and had just hit, I think, maybe 17 million in revenue. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the company was founded on this concept of conscious capitalism. Our founder, Matt O'Hare, uh, good friends for many years uh, with John Mackey, had read the essay called Conscious Capitalism, had read the book called Conscious Capitalism. I was handed that book, signed by John Mackey, when I arrived on day one. Um, and the stakeholder model and our stakeholders are reflected in our corporate values, which are not just on the wall, but they're what we talk about. They're how we make decisions. I'd never seen anything like this before. I've been in a lot of, arguably, great companies with great cultures, great values, but I don't think anybody could really tell you what they were. But in this company, every meeting revolved around them. And so uh, that was my first exposure to it. Over time, as we'll get into, I came to appreciate the approach as 
actually a superior one for creating, for, for ultimately maximizing shareholder value, ironically enough, mm -hmm. but perhaps over a different time period and with a different impact on the world than might otherwise be possible. Outstanding. Um, well, so we're going to frame this short conversation based on the four tenets. Um, and if I can, we'll dive in. And why don't we start with purpose? Um, so a question for you, as you think about purpose, you, you, your job as the leader of a B Corp and a purpose-built company is to align all of the stakeholders around that company's mission. If you could just kind of give people a bit of an overview on some of the difficulties, but the pros and cons of doing that, how you do that, how you infuse that into the stakeholder uh, model for all of your stakeholders at, at Bottle Farms, that would be great because along the way, you're going to meet a few skeptics. Mm -hmm. So it would be wonderful to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, you know, our mission is to improve the lives of people, animals, and the planet through food, which could be interpreted a lot of different ways, but we do that by working with um, a group of really uh, high quality small family farms um, across the United States and bringing their foods to market. So we try to scale up the parts of the food system that lend themselves to scale while allowing small family farmers to not scale in order to survive and, and thrive. And um, that articulating that and living by that is remarkably effective at attracting stakeholders, attracting great, high talent, high caliber employees, we call them crew members, mm -hmm. uh, attracting the right farmers with the right mindset who don't look at our high standards or our crazy requests as uh, sort of costs to endure in order to get the contract, but rather understand that they're actually part and parcel of our right to win over time, including the farmer's right to win over time. It's great at attracting, but where the rubber meets the road is on that day when maybe the decision you've got to make doesn't feel great to one or more of those stakeholders, but you still have the courage of your convictions that it's right for the long-term sustainability of all the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been certainly many times along that journey where I have had conscious capitalism thrown back, weaponized by a stakeholder who said, how can you do that to me? I thought you guys were a conscious company. Shouldn't you do X, Y, and Z for me? I thought you cared about farmers or people or whatever. And um, those are maybe some of the hardest days. Um, with regard to investors, it's very interesting. As a private company, um, we had curated and frankly had the privilege to attract a really, really amazing, almost dream team of investors over the years. Um, and I say that because um, I think in many cases, I have a lot of friends who work in, in private equity backed companies and, and their stories of their interactions with their board members and the kinds of discussions and debates and the incentives, et cetera, are not super inspiring. And in this case, um, I, without exception, the conversations were certainly challenging at times, but there was this uh, alignment around this purpose and this longer term mission that far superseded what was gonna happen the next quarter. Um, we are now a public company and we had eyes wide open and we have, I think, a pretty good story about why we chose to do that. But I now am meeting a lot of current and prospective investors who go back to what I thought in 1995 or 1999, which is, hey, this conscious capitalism thing sounds a little squishy. If you made an extra dollar this year, who do you decide to give it to? Which charity gets the dollar? And do you really think you should give it to them and not the shareholders? And so um, I think one of the, one of the things that I've um, felt the need to articulate and I believe is very defensible is the notion that conscious capitalism isn't a trade-off against successful capitalist competition. It is actually a better way to produce outsized returns over time. The difference may only about, be about time frame, but I'm about the most competitive person you're gonna meet. I like to win. I really like to win. And if I didn't think this was the right way to do it, I wouldn't be doing it. It's as simple as that. I didn't grow up wanting to be a part of a not-for-profit. So uh, it's interesting you say that because when you think about stakeholder integration and the conflicts that can come up, 
we've been at the board table a number of different times over the years where we've had to weigh um, the benefits and sometimes they're short-term benefits and sometimes they are not always in concert um, with the long-term benefits. Do you, I mean, I know it's always controversial as a public company CEO, but if you can go back to our private company days and just give people an example of how you as a leader um, were able to make a decision and in some cases build consensus around the board table for weighing the short and long-term benefits and, and making sure that you acted in, in the long-term best uh, way for your stakeholders and ultimately for your business model. So three come to mind, one's a little one, and then there are a couple of bigger ones that you were part of. Okay. Um, when, when I first joined Vital Farms, and this is sort of not just my own personal journey toward really being integrated into this movement, but it was also the company's journey. And we had great intentions six years, seven years ago, but maybe we didn't, it wasn't um, highly refined or we, maybe we didn't execute um, as well as we might have. Um, uh, I think in service of the notion that our crew members or employees are one of our stakeholder groups, there was a lot of pride and in fact insistence around the idea that we had never and would never fire someone from Vital Farms. And then the recovering MBA guy showed up. And my first job at Vital Farms was to run our 10,000 square foot warehouse and egg packing facility behind our office off of Todd Lane here in Austin. And I didn't know anything about eggs. I knew a little something about running a warehouse. And um, our, um, the warehouse manager was a no-call, no-show for my first 32 days at Vital Farms. And I went to the controller who also had HR duties in that very small team. And I said, hey, I gotta do something about this guy. He's like not coming to work. He's like, what do you wanna do? I said, well, in any other company I've been a part of, we'd fire him. We'd have fired him after the second one, not the 32nd one. And she was like, okay, you've got my support. Okay. So we go ahead and do it. And we had a rule then, which I loved, and a great example of, of how we were trying in fits and starts to, uh, to really live the values. We had a, a two-person termination rule. No one could terminate someone else alone. We had to have someone else come check. I guess it's like the two keys on the submarine to launch the missiles, right? So I needed to get another key holder to let me launch this missile. And Rudy came in, and I said, you have to go. I said, okay. And he left. And then a few days later, I was on a trip with, I would argue, the highest caliber person in that company at that time. She was our director of quality and farm relations. And we were on a field trip to go figure out why all of our eggs were broken. And, uh, and she said, I, I, now that I have you alone, I got to ask you, you, you know about our values, right? I said, yeah. She said, and you know, you read that book, Conscious Capitalism? I said, yeah. She said, how could you fire Rudy? She said, we're all about people. And she, this is a very sharp, sophisticated, I mean, I wish she were still with Vital Farms. She said, I don't get it, help me understand. Help me see what you saw in making that decision. And I walked her through the stakeholder model. I said, let me talk to you about the impact to our stakeholders of Rudy not showing up for 32 days. We'll start with the people in a span of care. Then we'll talk about the customers who didn't get the orders. Then we'll talk about the FDA who may not have loved our, uh, uh, our um, adherence to their rules in the absence of the guy that knew what the rules were, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end she said, oh, Got it. And then it was okay. But that first one, put in the courage of your convictions, that was, that was interesting. There was a moment there where I might have, the organization might have rejected me because it was, I looked so different. That decision was so anathema to what they'd done. And you were the new guy. But the other two that you were around for and that we kind of managed together, the first was, for a lot of good and not so good reasons, there was a global or an American glut of eggs, which is the primary thing we produce at a certain point in our history, I think 2016 or so. And we had accurately forecasted the market for the kinds of eggs we produced, but we had not accurately forecasted the entry of a second competitor to the market. And so we were 
not selling all the eggs we were buying. And the way that we work with our small family farmers to give them uh, long-term sustainability is we give them a, a contract with a guaranteed price and we buy everything they produce during the term of the contract, whether we need it or not. Well, buying really expensive eggs from farmers and throwing them away or donating them has a little bit of a cash impact on your small growing business. <laughs> Um, there were ways in our contracts, because as an integrator, just like Tyson Foods and Purdue, um, the, the brand has lots of outs, with lots of protections, and lots of ways that we can stick it to the farmer to make our numbers. And, and we didn't think that was the right answer. That didn't feel like the right answer for the farmers key stakeholder. It didn't feel like the right answer for long-term sustainability of anything we were doing, because if we screwed them in 2016, come 2017, it was gonna, would be really hard to get them back, right? And so we went to the board and said, um, we have too many eggs. It's gonna cost us $6 million in a year when our EBITDA budget was maybe one. Yeah. We're gonna need six million bucks to basically replace 100% of these farmers' income while they don't produce any eggs for us. We're gonna pay them $6 million to not sell us anything. To keep the eggs. You, sell them again. Yeah. What, what do you guys think about that? <laughs> Can I have $6 million to basically disappear for now? And Well, I looked at it. I remember you presenting it to the board, not to take your thunder, but the reality is you came and made this case to the board that was, this is not a short-term decision where we are paying people and writing off money. This is a short-term decision to put, make our supply chain more resilient and bulletproof. And if we do this, when the rest of the industry is gonna walk away from these contracts because that's what p companies had to do in some cases to survive. We don't have to if we raise a little bit of money and take the dilution, we will, two years, three years, five years, 10 years down the road, we will have to do less recruiting. And in, if you know anything about Vital, the company doesn't need to recruit new farmers. Farmers want to come work for Vital. And it's because of decisions like that. And I don't think we knew right mm -hmm. when you came in the boardroom to mm -hmm. start this discussion, just how important it was to make that decision the way we did. And it wasn't easy because it was a small company at the time. But it today is still in my mind something that sticks with me as not only the right decision, but it made it a stronger company mm -hmm. with a more resilient supply chain and the leading supply chain that could do so much more because people trusted the ethics of the business. And the, and the ability to take that stakeholder model and say not one part of the model has to sacrifice every time. We are all gonna have to try to figure out how we sacrifice to make sure that the pie is larger instead of it being just a, uh, um, a win-lose proposition. You, you, I would second that emotion, especially around not fully understanding the impact that that decision would have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't have a monopoly on small family farmers in this country, but I think we have pretty close to a monopoly on the very best of them. And we don't spend a penny in finding them, in attracting them, in selling them on an opportunity, they call us every day. Russell, would you be willing to come to my community? We heard what you did in that community. That decision looms large in our industry. And um, I think actually, if it, the, the last speaker mentioned his definition of strategy, which is the things you do that give you a right to win. How are we gonna win? One of the things that um, we have invested in heavily to support our right to win is having the best relationships with the best farmers, and it started with that decision. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we pivot to um, another topic, which is as we go down through the four tenets, um, something in leadership and culture. Um, how do you see your role as a leader um, building around the four tenets of, of conscious capitalism and, and infusing it into your culture at a time where not only have revenues grown 10x, but you know, the number of employees, what we call crew members at Vital Farms, has also grown 8, 9x, almost 10x. 
So how do you maintain hmm. the entire infrastructure and, and the concept of conscious capitalism as you're growing so quickly with so many new faces? You know, the, I had this conversation earlier today uh, with someone who was asking the broader question, which is how do you maintain and strengthen culture in a remote working environment? Because mm -hmm. similar, because that wasn't hard enough, we, we've gone 100% remote <laughs> and we aren't going back to the office. And uh, part of the answer is, you know, I don't know. Right? But the things that we do, and I think it all starts with leadership, it all starts with walking the talk every day consistently, never, never doing anything to lose the confidence of your stakeholders that you are what you say. And, uh, and, I, and we continue to have, I think, great examples of doing that um, that, that help reassure everyone, even those maybe slower adopters who are waiting to see the proof points that, that we do what we say. Um, we, uh, because we are very careful in selection to hire primarily for fit and then secondarily for skill, which I think to some extent we have a privilege of doing because we've gotten to a scale where we can carry somebody while they figure out the job. And, and I've never, with the exception of poor Rudy, I don't think I've ever terminated anybody for like missing a number. They, we term them long before they miss the number because we figure out they're not a fit with the culture and the values. Um, so it, 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 it's a little easier because I think we get the higher right more often than we get it wrong and we're pretty quick. The, or, the organism, the organization will reject the foreign body if we get it wrong, mm -hmm. which I think is a sign of a good and strong culture. Um, but I'll tell you an interesting topic that came up recently and something I'm going to address actually with a class for Vital Farms is that some of our more recent hires interpret conscious capitalism and our stakeholder approach as be nice, but they don't totally see the and win part of it. And so it shows up in interesting places. We wrote a contract with a vendor for something, packaging or something, and um, the vendor said, would you like 45 day terms? And the crew member said, nah, 30 is fine. We got to pay in 30 instead of 45. Why wouldn't we take the 45? It does, it, they were happy to give us 45. Well, giving ourselves a better cash flow is great for a lot of reasons. Um, but it didn't dawn upon them that winning financially is actually a pretty critical part of our ability to do any of the great things we're trying to do. So, and this notion of being competitive, I had a crew member, we were, um, is another egg company that, you know, many of them are trying to do bits and pieces of what we do. And, and we saw one of them start to break away from the pack and become more than just a, a little ankle biter. And which is weird for me to say because we feel like we're the ankle biters, but then there are even smaller ankle biters. And, and, um, and I remember having a town hall meeting and saying, guys, we need to address this competitive threat. It's different than before. We need to take a clean sheet of paper and think about what we're gonna do to continue to win. And I remember one of our crew members, actually a guy in HR who said, aren't they trying to do good stuff too? And isn't there enough room for both of us? And you, some, I mean, I've certainly heard John Mackey say that, you know, competitors are stakeholders too. I get that. And we have definitely over the years been made better by competitive threats. And I love, I, I don't care where the lesson comes from. I'll take the lesson as long as we operationalize it. But it, it, it was very personal for me and I made a very strong case for no. Because if you really think what we're doing is better for our stakeholders, than what that other guy's doing. Even if what the other guy's doing is incrementally better than some factory farm down the road, then every sale he gets is another farmer and another set of chickens in his system and not ours. So for you to believe we should both win, you have to tell me that his system's as good as ours. And then he got it. So we're gonna make a training about that because I can't just take it for granted that everybody gets we're competing to win here. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, we've got about five minutes to go, so. Uh, in, in, in preparation to close, I actually had a question that I wanted to ask you because I think this came up in one of our board meetings not too long ago, which is, I, I, over the years, having read the book and spent so much time with Matt and now you and with the company, I, I 
remember answering the question about what conscious capitalism meant to me. But I'd like to just ask you, now that we're here, people who are supportive and, and will all understand what our answers are, um, as a father, as a husband, as a CEO, leader of a company that is based on these four tenets, and even a community member, hmm. if you had to define what conscious capitalism means to you, hmm. what would you, how would you respond? Wow, where to start? How much time we got? <laughs> four minutes and 47 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> So the first thing I'd say is that what felt great and different than any other job I'd ever had was that I never felt like I had to trade off um, what I did in any given day with what I thought was the right answer and, and what I thought uh, would make my family proud of me. Um, that's a big deal, right? Yeah. And part of that startup, you have more of an opportunity to shape the thing, right? I've never had that opportunity before. But, but part of it is that when you come into a place and your values aligned, then your logic and your persuasion is more likely to land with the other stakeholders. If you got the stakeholders lined up with what your vision and your mission are, then chances are if you're halfway decent at your job, the things you're proposing fit right with what they thought and hoped you would do, right? So the impact on, on my, uh, on outside of work, I, I think um, has a lot to do with uh, one of the most important values that we espouse in support of conscious capitalism, which is empathy. Not sympathy, empathy. And the reason we talk about empathy is it's really hard to work with your stakeholders in a way that really makes it sustainable for the long haul if you can't walk in their shoes. You gotta understand why they want what they want. You need to help them understand why you want what you want. You're never gonna get to consensus if you just can't get to the same side of the table as them. And so when I started to find myself being more empathetic, and I did not grow up being a super empathetic guy. It's a topic for a different discussion. <laughs> um, I found that it bled over into other parts of my life. And it, I, I think, frankly, not to overstate things, that it helped me become a better father to Nathan, who's now 14 and still hugs me, which is a good thing. Um, it helped me to be a better spouse. It helped me to be a better community uh, member, for sure. Um, and one small specific example of that, um, I've never been in an organization before Vital Farms that I could bring my personal life and integrate it with my work life. Now, to some people, that sounds terrible. Like, oh my God, does your, <laughs> do you never get a weekend? But on the flip side, when I had to be away from my family, I wanted them to know who I was with and what I was doing. Well, our founder set a very great example from day one, which is when we have an offsite, you should bring your family too. We can have some fun, we can have some work. And so I didn't give it a second thought when we had a very high stakes um, onboarding of a group of farmers in Missouri back in 2015 who had been really abused by another egg company and we wanted to convince them we were different. I brought my wife, who's actually here, and my son, and we went to every one of their homes. We introduced our family to their families and my wife brought them her homemade organic granola. And that, that's powerful stuff. And, that, and nobody said, well, you know, it's not approved to expense your wife's flight. Nobody said, are you at work or are you at play? Because we were aligned and there was trust that I was doing the right thing for the system in that, in that moment. Including my wife and my son who went to a really cold Missouri in the middle of December with smiles on their faces. And with good granola. <laughs> and with good granola. Well, listen, I appreciate you giving us that example, and I appreciate you taking the time to sit with me and allowing me to come and, and question you in front of everyone. My understanding is we are not taking questions, so unless the organizers tell us that we are, I think we are finished for the day, and we are putting you all in a position where you can go and enjoy your evening. So I want to thank everyone for allowing us to come up and present to you, and I want to thank you for having me. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. Thanks, buddy.